This video is about cellular respiration and fermentation, learning targets 13 and 14 of Unit 5. Uh, it's going to be a two video set. The first video will be covering glycolysis and fermentation, with the second video covering the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So just as a review, we have spent some time talking about photosynthesis and photosynthesis is the reaction that takes energy from the sun and converts that energy along with carbon dioxide and water into oxygen and glucose. And glucose is the product that basically feeds the earth. And so this uh, for cellular respiration, we're going to be talking about how that glucose molecule in organisms is now taken apart. And in order to do cellular respiration, oxygen is required. Whereas oxygen was a waste product in photosynthesis, now it is necessary for cellular respiration to occur. There are two kinds of organisms. There are organisms that are considered aerobic because they need oxygen in order to breathe or in order to do cellular respiration. And then there are other organisms that are anaerobic and because they do not require oxygen in order to do cellular respiration or in order to make energy. And again, glucose, here's a picture of here's a picture of our glucose molecule. Glucose represents energy and it represents energy because of the energy that is stored in these chemical bonds. Remember the Calvin cycle we put this glucose molecule together and when we did that we put energy into it using molecules like ATP and NADPH. Well with the cellular respiration we're going to be taking that molecule apart and pulling that energy that we put in back out of it. Um, when we talk about energy in food, we use a term called calories. And calories are just the measurement of the amount of energy in food. The technical term for a calorie, our definition of a calorie is it is the amount of energy required to heat one milliliter of water one degree Celsius. But for our purposes, a calorie just shows how much energy is in food. We won't be talking about food in terms of calories, but we will be talking about it in terms of ATP. We will spend a lot of time talking about ATP. And this is the equation for aerobic respiration. It's the bottom one, or cellular respiration. Now, if you'll notice, the, the equation above that, photosynthesis, is very similar in that the products of photosynthesis are the reactants of cellular respiration. So the glucose and the oxygen made in photosynthesis are used so that cellular respiration can occur. And conversely, the reactants of photosynthesis, including energy, are the products of cellular respiration so that we put CO2, H2O, and energy into photosynthesis and we get those very things back out of cellular respiration. Here's a picture of that as well. You know that the photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast in the plant cells. Well, the cellular respiration takes place in the mitochondria of eukaryotic cells. Remember, plant cells also have mitochondria, so don't get that confused. And if you'll see here, chloroplast makes oxygen and glucose. Those things are fed into cellular respiration, and out comes ATP and heat. Well, CO2 and H2O are, pro are other products of cellular respiration, and those are fed back into the chloroplast along with sunlight and just like all cycles that we've talked about you only get out what you put in 
And so we put in energy of sunlight and we're able to get energy back out in the form of ATP. There are three phases or three parts to cellular respiration. The first part of cellular respiration is called glycolysis. Now, for each one of these parts, there is something that is going into it and then something that is coming out of it. You know, each part has a reactant and then each part has a product. Well, in glycolysis, glucose is the part that is going in. Remember, we, glucose is the main reactant for cellular respiration. This is what is being broken down. And glycolysis is going to start with the glucose and is going to break that glucose down in order to create two pyruvate molecules. A glucose is a six carbon molecule and pyruvate then would be two three carbon molecules. This reaction is happening in the cytosol. Now why is that important? Well, the cytosol again is a part that all cells have. Bacteria, plant cells, fungus, uh, animal cells, and so forth. And so this process, glycolysis, takes place in all living things. And another part is that glycolysis does not require oxygen. Even though it is part of cellular respiration, it does not require oxygen in order to occur. The next part is the Krebs cycle. And the pyruvate of the Krebs cycle is fed, in, or the pyruvate of the gly, of glycolysis is fed into the Krebs cycle and creates electron carriers. So the Krebs cycle uses pyruvate in order to create electron carriers. The Krebs cycle does require oxygen. If there is no oxygen in the cell, the Krebs cycle will not occur. CO2 is released in this cycle, so this is where um, the byproduct CO2 is created. And then the Krebs cycle takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria. So the first phase, glycolysis, feeds in, glucose gets out, pyruvate, second cycle, Krebs cycle, um, or the second part, Krebs cycle, puts in pyruvate, gets out electron carriers, and the third part is the electron transport chain, which happens on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And this phase uses the electron carriers created in the Krebs cycle and in glycolysis in order to make ATP. So we kind of close up the chain, whereas glucose, whereas the entirety of cellular respiration, the goal is to take glucose in order to make ATP. The electron transport chain finishes that up using the electron carriers made in Krebs cycle in order to make ATP. ATP synthase is part of this, very similar to what we saw in the plants, very similar usage as well. And this process, again, I said, takes place in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. This process does require oxygen as well. So I didn't mention, but to make sure we understand, a good working definition of cellular respiration is the process of the breaking down glucose in the presence of oxygen in order to make ATP. And we see that glucose go through the phases and ATP at the end come out. So for glycolysis, I will normally start with a picture that looks like this, but what I have discovered is that starting with a blank slate and drawing it has been much better in teaching this. So again, this is glycolysis, and glycolysis starts with a glucose molecule. Well, for this glucose molecule, I'm going to draw six circles. And these six circles represent the six carbons of glucose. And I will not draw the C's in there. We'll just remember that those blue circles are indeed carbons. Now, glycolysis has two phases. The first phase is called the investment phase. 
you know, like any investment, you make an investment in, with the hopes of getting something back out of that even more than what you put into it. And so the investment phase of glycolysis is paying energy in order to get more energy back out. Well, this is a cell and the cell's energy currency is ATP. And so we are going to pay in to ATP. And those two ATP are going to be used to split this, this glucose molecule into two pieces. And of course, when we pay two ATP, we get to ADP in return. Those phosphate molecules are attached to the glucose and they are used to cut that glucose molecule in half. And now we have two separate three carbon molecules. I'll draw these a little bigger. Consequently, these two G, these two uh, molecules are called G3P, which we'll, if you remember, we put two G3Ps together in the Calvin cycle in order to make a glucose. So here they are again. Uh, the name's not important uh, for the purposes of our class, but it is something to kind of bring back to what we learned in the Calvin cycle. Now, these two three these two G3Ps need to be modified before we get our product, which again is 2 pyruvates. And this second part is called the payoff phase. So we've invested something, we've invested 2 ATP, and now we are looking for a payoff. And that is a, what we're going to get here. In the first part of the payoff, each G3P is going to produce two ATP. One of the questions I'm commonly asked in my freshman biology class is, where do these things come from? Well, for our purposes, not having had chemistry, we're going to keep it at a at the level of these ADPs were around, and there were phosphates available on the G3Ps, and those phosphates were able to be picked up by these ADPs in order to make energy. There's obviously more chemical processes there, but for our purposes, these phosphates were available, and those uh, ADPs came and picked them up and we made some ATP here. Also, the act of splitting those molecules is going to free up some electrons. And just like with photosynthesis, we have electron carriers. And these electron carriers, or in this case, is NAD plus, it's going to combine with two electrons, it's going to become NADH. Now, that's the payoff phase, and we also have these two pyruvates, of course, which are our goal. So, in the investment phase, we paid two ATP. So, you could say that we're at a negative two ATP right after we begin glycolysis. But in the payoff phase, we make four ATP. So, if you can imagine me telling you today, I'm going to ask you to give me two dollars, but tomorrow I'm going to give you four. How much money will you have made tomorrow? Two bucks. And so by the end of glucose, we have netted two ATP. And we have also gained two NADH. That's glycolysis. Two pyruvate molecules, also called pyruvic acid, you may see that. Two net ATPs and two NADHs, which are electron carriers. So, the next question is oxygen present. If oxygen is present, those pyruvate molecules will travel to the mitochondria and be 
and get into the Krebs cycle. If oxygen is not present, a process called fermentation takes place. All organisms have fermentation if oxygen is not present. Some organisms such as yeast and bacteria go through something called alcoholic fermentation. And alcoholic fermentation uh, is very similar to lactic acid fermentation, which animal cells go through. And then they're similar in the fact that they have the same goal. Fermentation's goal is to free up the electron carriers that were made in glycolysis, in ADH, to free up the electrons, to take off the H, so that glycolysis can continue. If there is no oxygen, those electrons cannot be dropped off at the electron transport chain, which is on down the line. So in order to free up those electrons so that we can have more NAD plus to continue glycolysis, if you remember back here, we need NAD plus to make for glycolysis to do this reaction. We need NAD plus. So we're going to free up the NADH by making NAD plus in fermentation. And then those NAD pluses will feed back into the reaction of glycolysis, which is actually back here. I'll show you a picture of this that makes it more clear. Alcoholic fermentation, you have glucose to pyruvate, that's our glycolysis, and you can see the ATPs that are made, the NADH that's made. Well, if you'll notice, in alcoholic fermentation, remember pyruvate had three carbon molecules. Well, one of those carbons is given off as CO2. And we're left with two carbons, which later turned to ethanol, which is the same as, as alcohol. And the NADH then changes to back to NAD plus so that NAD plus can be fed back into glycolysis. And so fermentation happens so that glycolysis can continue. Glycolysis is producing a small amount of ATP, but a small amount of ATP is better than no ATP at all. And so lactic acid fermentation is very similar, except for that pyruvate does not lose a carbon and is just converted to lactic acid or lactate. And you can see the NADHs and the NADs are doing the same circle there. Lactic acid is the reason that uh, your muscles get sore when you perform anaerobic exercises. And of course, alcoholic fermentation is why we have products like beer, wine, and bread. Because the yeast and the uh, in bread, for instance, releases CO2, which causes the bread to rise, produces alcohol, which the alcohol bakes out of the bread. So that's fermentation. The next video will go over the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain.